Let's discuss now. Angela Rise here, Karen Finney as well. The perfect people to talk about what we're going to talk about and to react to what Joe Biden said earlier. Hello to both of you. Good to see you. So, Angela, I'm going to start with you because you heard what Joe Biden, you heard him tonight invoke the, uh, the movement sparked by the death of George Floyd to address systemic racism in this country. How do you think he did? Well, I want to start um, with something positive, and that is where he began his speech tonight. He started with Ella Baker, um, and I, get, I give him so much credit and the team credit for doing just that. She is one of the most prolific um, activists, civil rights activists of our time, and um, or before our time. But I really just think that it's so important for us to understand these words as well from Ella Baker. She said, in order for us as poor and oppressed people to become part of a society that is meaningful. The system under which we now exist has to be radically changed. It means facing a system that does not lend itself to your needs and devising means by which you change that system. Why am I starting there, Don? I think it's important as he talks about Gianna Floyd, as he talks about George Floyd, as he's put out tweets about Breonna Taylor, that we don't just talk about what the country needs to do. Just like he had a plan for that, as Elizabeth Warren would say, about Social Security and Medicare. He had a plan for that about ensuring equitable wages for essential workers, that we don't just see them as essential, but we pay them as essential. Just as he had a plan for all of that, he has to have plans for criminal justice reform. He has to have plans for police reform. <clears throat> He can't be afraid of it because there might be an endorsement from a police union. It was such a good, powerful moment, but it was lacking on the substance that these young folks who have been in the streets all summer so desperately need to see from Joe Biden. And it shouldn't just fall on Kamala. That's the truth. If he says he supports justice in policing, I wanted to hear him say tonight, one of the first things I will do in my first 30 days after being sworn in is address police reform by signing justice in policing, right? I mean, it's just, it doesn't have to be a heavy lift, but I just wanted a little more heft there. What do you think, Karen? I agree, but at the same time, you know, these speeches are meant to reach out to broad swaths of the American electorate to say, you know, throughout this week, it has been about character. It has been about what's at stake in this election. And I felt like his speech tonight was trying to say, you can, tr I am someone you can trust. And I felt like there were, I mean, you know, I was thrilled that he started with Ella Baker and, uh, and so many touch points throughout the speech. I mean, my God, having that beautiful child, Brayden, think what that yeah. means to children who struggle with different types of, um, dis you know, abilities, let's put it that way. So I felt like he was trying to make a number of different touch points, which is a very hard thing to do in a speech, to bring around values as well as issues, as well as make the case for why he's the person. But I'm with Angela in that there is more work to be done, As a, frankly, as an activist on women's rights. There's more I want to hear from him when it comes to protecting Roe v. Wade. So there are any, all of us can listen for different things that we want to hear. At the same time, I think what we have to fundamentally ask ourselves in this moment is, who do you trust to have that conversation with, to have the, to be in those struggles with come November 3rd and then going forward? And to my mind, that's Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. That doesn't, and look, I also felt like, and y'all are not going to take my joy because I love tonight. I thought it was You're not gonna beautiful steal my joy. And special <laughs> and I loved it. You're not. I'm not going to have it right now because... <laughs> You know, I felt inspired by that speech, and I didn't expect to, to be perfectly okay. honest. Because, okay. You know, so, so I, I loved it, and I, I understand what he was trying to do. That does not take away from the seriousness, though, of the point that um, Angela is making. You. I got you, but I, I understand. I, I get what you're saying, but I think that in, in these, these are, as you said, these are broad speeches. I think a nod is great. I don't, I don't, people don't want to hear specific policies in a speech that is yeah. accepted. I think that, but uh, Angela, I just don't think it's strategic in this moment. I don't think that there's enough clarity around the issue to give specific policies. I don't think that anybody in this moment when they're accepting something should back themselves into a corner about something they, they can and cannot do because they may not and be I, able to live I, up to it in their thing. I think a nod is great. I understand you. I feel you. I'm going to work on it. But to give specific policy points, I think would just... Um, he didn't. He but, didn't say he was gonna work on it, Don. That's exactly my point. I right. didn't say that. That's not true. He, that's hold not on, true. hold on one second. Hold on one second. 
He didn't say, I didn't ask that he says, I'm going to end qualified immunity, right? I didn't ask that he says he deals with stop and frisk policy. When it came to um, a, a different path to heal and reform, um, a first step, I'm going to be addressing the co coronavirus. That is the first step I'm going to take. Um, I'm going to deal with student debt, elder, elder care, and child care. When it came to George Floyd, he said, she said to him, my daddy's going to change the world. Full stop. He said that we need to end racial, we need to address racial injustice and white supremacy. That's cool. But what I'm saying is when it came to elder care and child care, it was a bit more specific. I'm talking about an olive branch to folks on the streets who yeah. have only been confronted with a record of Joe Biden that is his Senate record. I, I don't think that it's fair because it doesn't include okay, an evolution. I get you. I get you. I get you. But I'm asking you. him to talk about what that evolution but I wanna, is. But I want to go on and talk a little bit more about what Chris and I were, were talking about. Um, and, yeah. And we're talking, and I know, Karen, you have specifics that you want to talk about before we run out of time. I said that um, maybe if there's, if there's anything good to come out of the, this current administration, the current president, yeah. that he has gotten us to a place where people are so frustrated that maybe there can be some common ground between African Americans and, and, and poor white people or people who are uh, facing very similar struggles. Well, and you know what? My God, it feels like the Poor People's Campaign all over again. That was exactly what Dr. King was trying to talk about. This is when you think about the lie of what the Confederacy was about, which was about pitting poor white farmers, poor white people against black people to say, at least we're, you're better than them, while they were getting screwed over by rich white landowners. We are here again in this moment where the point is black and brown and white and southern and northern. If you are on the bottom, you're on the bottom. It doesn't matter what color you are, what, gen you know, what gender you are, any of that. What matters is if we can come together, that's how we're gonna lift ourselves up. And I feel like we're in this moment, Don, this is what, you know, when you and Chris were talking, where Trump again has us fighting over the scraps and has told, you know, his base, you know, pointing the finger at, well, those women are, are the reason they need to stay in their place. Well, those black people, well, those Latinos coming over here, they're taking our jobs. He's got us, he's trying to convince people to go back into this fight where we're scrumming over scraps mm -hmm. instead mm -hmm. of saying, well, hold up, how come all these corporations and their CEOs seem to be doing just fine and making a pretty penny and a profit at a time when we're left here dying from because of COVID policies because he put into place. Ask? Because That's of policies right. he put into place. Angela, you want to say something That's before right. I have to get to, to the break? You want to weigh in on this? Again, I just think that he had a great speech tonight. I think that we still have to work on perfecting to the finish line. This isn't about tearing him down. This is about counting votes, mm -hmm. period. And so while you're, you guys were saying, hey, young people don't vote, that's not, an, that's not a reality we should be accepting. It is that? how do we mobilize them? That? No, we're no, talking no, about Karen, me and Chris, Karen, not you. Not you, not you, okay. Chris. Okay. you and Chris. Yeah. Or, I'm sorry, Don and Chris. The point is that when you talk about young people not voting, we can't afford to bet on just older folks. We can't afford to count on that same electoral map from 2016. That is not sufficient. The anti-Trump vote is not sufficient. You have to be pro something and be very specific. It, this was not a State of the Union address, I'm clear, but just around what your general commitments are to serve the whole of the Big Ten, right? And the whole of the, uh, the American population who he says he's serving whether you support him and, and vote for him or not. Angela Rye, Karen Finney, Fabulous conversation. Let's talk more, but we'll do it later. Absolutely. Thank you. We'll be right back. Bye.